Yes, there we go. So tomorrow I'm going to wear another hat. We are going to have an event at the 0047, uh, coordinated by, uh, moderated by Carson Chen about uh, exhibition and architecture, where Andres, that is also here, and Martin are going to participate. And there I'm going to be having my hat as the director of a storefront and someone that thinks about architecture uh, as something that engages a larger collectivity. Today I'm here to talk more about how I engage the role of being an architect through a very precise um, mode of practice that is not so much the one that is based on destination, the one based on the building, but the one based on method. I'm interested in talking about methodology and the role of the architect in trying to envision different ways of walking this path of construction towards the built environment. So, this is in a certain way what you cannot see, what resides inside uh, my head. These are all the different projects that today I'm going to explain, some of them except the ones that are actually built. So you will just see that's those ones that are unbuilt. Um, but before we get there, where do we reside? Um, within this diagram, and I apologize for the light, but we cannot do anything about it, so we, we, you will have to imagine uh, that this is much brighter, I'm sure we all can do that. So if we would say that the architectural discipline during the last 10, 15 years has been atomized not only uh, in different uh, moments of expertise, but also in different moments of uh, action uh, within social, political, ecological, cultural, technological spheres, then this last 10, 15 years, they really did a disfavor in what the architect's role was during most uh, of its history as a practicing uh, element within society. That is the one that is able to bring all those different elements together. Thankfully, we always have some other interferences within society that help us, and they are called crises. And we are in ecological crisis, in political crisis, in social crisis, in disciplinary crises, in many different places throughout the globe. So what crisis actually does is that all these different spaces of established power open up into spaces of experimentation and of, uh, of dialogue in order to search and to see that what the future could look like. So when we are actually looking into art and architecture and we look into crisis as the force, I imagine the future of being something less organized and less estrated and something that constructs a much more illegible figure, if you want, but where all these moments of cross fertilization, they really take command. So, of course, within this scenario, um, architects, we have been playing several roles. And I like always to distinguish architects, uh, simplifying them through three different categories the enablers, the iconographers, and the agitators. Um, and why I like to do that? Because I think that we have some things that need to be blamed on us. The enablers are architects that in a, simple, in a simple and easy way they just take any commission and they just say I'm just going to facilitate, they are facilitators. With this idea of just allowing things to happen, they are in a certain way as oppressive as the dictators, as the ideological constrainers, because they allow anything to happen. The iconographers are the ones who actually try to play the drama of signification and meaning. And they think that they are going to transmit a certain meaning of society through a moment of banal figurization, figurality of certain thoughts. And in this uh, game of representation and semantic aspiration, most of the times we end up with certain moments of huge banality, easy metaphors as uh, I always like to re recall. And then we have the agitators that are the avant-garde architects who are against everything and all, who are in a certain way in an edible fight against the parents of the enablers and the iconographers, that they don't really necessarily provide anything except those moments of disruption. So I actually like to introduce a fourth type, the type that I like to define as the utopianizer. And this utopianizer, he is not the, the guy who actually dreams about certain ideal cities or perfect societies, but he's the architect who actually takes the ground of society and tries to transform it through precise questions and moments of incision and produces a moment of separation into another space of desire that produces these vectors of desire and once it gets there, it moves somewhere else. It's not someone necessarily interested in the construction of things, but in the constructions of desires. So why utopianizers and how do these utopianizers operate? So in order to 
show you how do I think that a utopianizer operates, I'm going to go through these several points. How to become a utopianizer is a very easy manual. So, like the first point is go cosmopolitan ethics. Um, and what does cosmopolitan ethics mean? It means simply try to run away from solipsistic form shapes. How do we spend our time, our energy, and thoughts? And how can we do learning and construction and living more sensible to the questions of our time? It's something that interests me not only as a professor, as an architect, as an agitator, as an iconographer, as an enabler, but as a colleague. Um, not only where we spend our time, but there we do not spend it. That's an important question. Um, there is a tendency within our discipline to attach ourselves to certain words, to certain concepts. In the United States, is the concept of lead or notions of sustainability. And we put those elements as labels, as things that we just, in a certain way, fulfill. These little boxes that we say, check. This, done, check. And so those are moments that we don't rethink, that we don't question, and we don't take them as an opportunity for reinvention. So, in order to go to cosmopolitan ethics, to go away from a certain morality that society gives us through these boxes and codes, one needs to reconstruct, construct new territories, to draw these maps of things that still do not have a space of canonized uh, realms of understanding. The second one, be a world citizen and think big and small, construct relations. Um, of course, we need to go beyond linguistic, political and social boundaries, and we know it now more than ever, probably. All the imaginary that already appeared in the 40s of the globe as a like, global scale has allowed us to think about these relationships. The three, democratize action, invent new programs. The current models of societal structure follow still, and I say still because it still has been for a long time, a pyramidal form based on hierarchical structures of class society or what I like to call archaic thought. The social contract fantasized about the potentiality of every human subject, devoided of pre-existing privileges and acquired social status, performing an equally valuable role within a given society. So how does one actually go to democratizing action to construct new programs? Well, we need to think that perhaps we are all handicaps, that we are all blind people, that we are all short people that we are all something else and try to invent programs for these subjects that still do not exist. So, free speech. Well, invent new words. How to liberate the taboos that the history of ideas has produced or even actually how to do it through onomatopoeic thought, something that goes like <coughs> like that. Something that I think architecturally is still very necessary. So. How do we go into unveiling power structures or to denounce fan atisms? For hundreds of years, ocular centrism has not only constructed the dominant discourse about architectural representation, it has also constructed through depictions, drawings, and maps, or social interactions, institutions, cities, and territories. An image and its after image carry within themselves histories, performative scripts of characters, discourses, and conventions. To rethink representation and to construct a new sensorium means that if we can look into our built environment and to sense that there are other things like smells, sounds, textures that we can start taking as new ground for exploration, perhaps we can build an architecture that still hasn't been monopolized by all those structures of power. So remember the future. How do we go and remember the future? History is not the history of ideas. There are ages in history. The first history is the history of the recent past, and this history is always the history of the powerful ones. Only time, paradigm shifts, and what I like to call intrepid historians, are the ones who actually give transcendence to the ideas. For this, to create timelines, to create your own history, allows us to remember not only the past, but also a future. And ultimately, one of the most important points is to love. But because I'm really bad at making jokes and I cannot do loves, I make manifestos, I make stories. So uh, they are kind of different mood. But uh, Tristan Zaraki said, in order to launch a manifesto, you have to want A, B, and C, and fulminate against one, two, and three. And I think this is still 
valid nowadays. You know, the only problem is that every one of us uh, hides under a certain notion of project statement, what do we do, who do we want to be, but we are too shy. We don't want to compromise our ability to actually negotiate with someone, so we forgot to fulminate. And I don't believe that there are things that we still need to fulminate against one, two, and three. So now that I went through that, I'm going to go through these points again, showing some projects that actually illustrate some of these moments of reinvention. This is a project in Berlin uh, uh, from 2003, where actually it was trying to do a master plan not based on urban form, but a master plan based on urban sensorium, meaning sound, pollution, um, air, um, temperature of the asphalt, in such a way that once you're able to map, and of course, the mapping has been used and abused very much in the last years, but once you're able to map and identify certain conditions, you can modify them in order to create topographies that allow for a space of playfulness, and playfulness not as numbness, but playfulness as a space of discovery and of excursion of certain conditions that as human subjects sometimes we are just constrained into the 30, no, 30 would be too hot, 27 degrees, right? So. Um, how actually we can think architecture from a way that is not only based on form, that is not only based on those canonical realms that we learn, but we start thinking about parameters that do not tell us about what we see, but about how we actually do feel. So, and for that, obviously, one needs to start drawing and to create a new vocabulary about how is one to think what is a master plan and how a master plan can take different forms. To be a world citizen and to construct relations and thinking big and small. This is a project in Shenzhen, in a, one of the urban global villages, where you find these kind of situations, where you find chickens within cages, and you find uh, human subjects within, within cages, in many ways, where you find toilets in the corner, someone selling the meat, and next to it you find these huge towers of glass. How one actually reconciles the desire for progress that the world, like certain areas in, in the Middle East, uh, in, in South Asia, in China, are trying to thrive without actually forgetting the value of these places. This urban village in Shenzhen has an amazing, intricate urban fabric, what we would call here perhaps the romantic old fabric. So how actually one goes and brings the desire of a contemporary city with connectivity, with different vectors of desire, of understanding that one needs to be able to connect into all these different speeds and still keep a certain relationship to a urban fabric and to a certain urban past. If we think that the city is able to carry a certain notion of memory, as architects we need to be able to understand what that means beyond the canon, beyond the surface. So this project it was a project that actually just tries to understand that, to construct relationships within different local elements, within the neighborhood, within notions of memory and form, within the, constructing the desires within the existing elements, and of course always understand that architecture is a space of colonization. But colonization we can allow. As an architect, I'm always interested not in providing that what I'm being asked, but in providing that what no one actually really asks. So of course no one is going to ask you that people want Chanel, but also they have chickens. So the interesting idea is that you should bring together these two characters in the same space and try to understand how actually that is going to make of life a much more rich experience. So of course this was the entire master plan, thinking from uh, the subway to the parking garages to the different housing units and the different housing typologies. But the most important part was when, in top of the towers and the city, this nomadic space for the floating population of Asia that actually arrived to China, that arrived to the capitals from this migration from the suburban to the urban centers, would be able to find an instant city not for the dreams of the Chanel ones, but for the guys who actually come with their bags, that usually are in the corners, but in this city, they would actually be able to be camping above your head, not hidden from your side, but constantly there as a certain weight of consciousness. So this cloud of uh, instant architecture for the homeless was perhaps the one that they didn't ask. But in the sections, actually, they tried to really disappear. So I'm sure that one day I will get this commission. I will be able to build this cloud. And we will have the homeless of our heads. So um, in any case, that um, those are always the desires that even working within the constraints given by society, one needs to postulate, to orchestrate those elements that one uh, thinks are necessary 
to bring. So democratize action. So construct new programs. This is a project that was born out of the desire of asking, what are welfare <laughs> exhibitions? And in a time where actually moving, making the processional uh, translation into a space of exhibition, what are actually we gaining in a space where information is traveling easily and fast into all our desktops, into all our own mobile devices. So where do we actually place the public sphere? Where do we understand the space of encounter and what we could actually call the dissolution of the spheres? So this project that was based in a welfare exhibition master plan was trying to understand how actually one constructs these moments of surprise. And I always say the importance of architecture in relationship to any other space of encounter is its ability to produce goosebumps. And I know that we are not going to theorize architecture as goosebumps, because we would go into the esoteric realm and we don't want to enter that. But, um, but that's something that actually I have to say is always the one that triggers me and I aspire in some ways. So how in this place, if you have been in the Netherlands, in the Harlem or Marpolder, uh, Holland is this place where the naturalized landscape is always showing this artificiality, where you have water above your heads, where you're under the sea, where flowers are there, where there shouldn't be, and so on. So taking very, and I'm going to go move very fast, taking just very, <laughs> a bit faster, I mean. <laughs> uh, just taking very like three single elements, that one is the slope and understanding how the water moves through the slope and trying to bring something visible that is usually invisible in the Netherlands, that is the change of the movement of water. The channels, usually, the channels they usually change of level, but you never see the water moving. So how do you introduce this horizontal movement in a place that water only moves vertically, works through the introduction of the slope? So this is a master plan that happens. This is the canal, one of the canals of the Harbour Polder, and this was the platform of like 500 meters by 200, and trying to say, okay, how do you organize eight pavilions in the middle of this nowhere? of the middle of this landscape, um, and bringing three basic elements, earth, water, and air. How we actually relate in a place like that into these different elements, and how do we actually draw the subjects, the wind city people, the water city people, or the earth city people? How do we behave differently? How do we dress differently? How do we feel differently? How do we look differently? Um, so these were most of the uh, final sections that arrived to construct all these different uh, pavilions, but where I want to go is uh, especially to one of them. But these were different of the uh, categories that uh, I brought into the project. Fields, uh, flowers in the shadow, wind into the quietness, sun uh, into the shadow, shadows in the sun. How do you bring disruptions of that what is an impossibility in order to create an awareness and an encounter? The moment that you find a surprise, that you actually say, is this really happening? You start the conversation. So how do you produce disruptions within society so that actually that conversation starts to happen, that you say, you really need to go and see that? That's something that architecture can really produce and bring those collectives in there. Um, those are, these are different elements uh, that, if this is the water level, right, but this is the earth level that is in the ground, how actually one brings the reminiscence of the water, how the structure in this case, uh, taking the forms of the stones, of the pebbles, uh, talking about easy metaphors, but there are certain forms that have a certain notion of legibility and reminiscence, um, are things that are interesting. In terms of drawing, how actually one goes and draws how people are going to move, and how one starts predicting those encounters. How a space like this, where suddenly the reflections are able to bring the encounters between all these different subjects, where a technical floor is able to bring wind, sun, light in a place where there is not. So where you are actually on the ground and you're able to take these periscopes and look above and find that you are under the water, look above, see that you are in the air, and look above and see that you are in a space of interiority. How those moments of unexpected encounters of what is inside and outside, or what is you and I, how you actually collapse the idea of one and the other. I think architecture has the power of producing that. So the water level, how this uh, incision within the canal with this platform was able to produce these moments of irrigation and the looseness of the plane and rendering visible something that, well, you actually know it very well here in Oslo, what a slope can actually do and into a shore that was usually cut. Or how something that is very simple as a swing, I don't understand why all buildings have doors but have no swings. 
Um, uh, a swing is an extremely important device to understand different perceptions, points of view, relationships, so I would encourage that. Thinking about materialities, when we talk about history and thinking about the insertion of certain notions of time, if we would put everything that we actually have in our pockets and we would that would be metal, we would put it in a mix of concrete and we would just make this column, we would have a print of time, a print of time frozen. So just thinking of how we actually think about time and like the idea of engraved intelligence within our everyday elements was something that was interesting for me to think about this huge concrete platform and how this was one of the modules for the ceiling to cast where you actually give the worker, it's not only for the people who are going to inhabit the place but the people who are going to be building this place uh, you give three modules and they, you give them authorship, you give them a space of playfulness. So this is, uh, this is a ceiling drawing of this section uh, where actually while thinking through it, I was thinking about the guys who were actually going to be working, playing and talking about it and having a conversation about what do you think if of? And I do think that architects we have to be able to engage throughout all the system of production. The consciousness is not only if things are ecological and sustainable, but if they are sustainable for the ones who actually engage within our processes of thinking. Um, so, I'm not going to talk about the structure. Uh, back. Mainly because there were like three different systems that overlap with each other, um, with the slabs that were seriously uh, challenging, um, but in a place like the boulder where you have this total moment of horizontality, for me it was important to be able to have as, ma as few moments of connection as possible. So. Within this master plan, uh, I design one pavilion. Um, and this is, again, talking about how actually one goes out. This is a moment of uh, intimacy that one sometimes reveals, but it's not necessarily something of any interest, probably, to anyone. But uh, obsessions, we all have some. And so every one of us has been looking into, in a sense, tenth painting, but looking into how actually one organizes the pictorial devices um, of a piece like this where the ground, the earth, where the feet, this moment of connection to the earth is able to bring the forces into these kind of vectors, into the central space where the hands, where the guts are, where the stomach is, start losing their forms into this folding and the head, this space of ideas where in a Cartesian place <laughs> everything goes, uh, simply has these elements, these lines of connection towards this moment of a scream, towards this moment <laughs> of thought. So trying to think about a pavilion. A pavilion, I said, well, we don't need more information. We don't need actually anything else to display. The only thing that we actually need in contemporary society is a moment of pause. We actually just need to be quiet. We have been, we have arrived, at least my generation, to a point that no one is religious. We don't, we are not forced to go every Sunday to church. Uh, therefore, you don't sit for an hour thinking about what are we actually doing or thinking. Sometimes uh, some friends go to yoga. That is another space of fakeness for that regard, perhaps. And so I just thought, well, maybe a pause pavilion where you just go and stop. So what is a pause made of? How do you create a moment of nothingness? How do you create a moment of void? It's not something that you say, void, now. Um, you have to construct it. So thinking through this moment of birth, life, and death, and trying to create and to distill these moments of intensity uh, through these conceptual images, I was trying to figure out how one actually goes into a moment of introspection, realization of everyday life, and this moment of void, trying to understand how these different topographies in the level of earth, birth, water, life, and uh, air, death. Uh, one actually goes into this moment where time doesn't matter anymore, into a place where only the encounter really exists, and a place that actually is an invention, because we are never born. We are just alive, right? So. Uh, how one actually goes into architect architecturalizing a moment like that and trying to create a building that embodies that is like this initiating moment that doesn't exist, that is birth, that it belongs to the plane of life, into this uh, moment of death, of departure, that moves away from any notion of ground. So the age of the birth, this urban station, was built out of different sound topographies, light topographies, that were uh, constructing 
so these heartbeats, uh, so what we see in here is different uh, elements, super, like overlay of sound, of temperatures, of textures, that try in this moment where you actually are entering and bringing you down to this space of like petal acoustic position uh, to try to bring you into a moment that we actually do not remember. So how do we go into the space of life, the urban level uh, of water? Is that what we actually do? Who we are? Well, we eat, we uh, consume, we excrete, like ex excrement? Well, yes. Um, we have knowledge, we have music. Uh, so this was a recreation of that what we actually do from getting to know culture, language, science, uh, and just in a certain way in a scenography of life, in such a way that the banalization of all these daily movements, almost like a thematization of everyday life, becomes apparent to the point that the sound and music becomes so obnoxious that one just actually really needs to move away through these stairs into this space that is just a grid where the temperature suddenly is much colder where you are in this forest where actually only one person is able to walk through, so suddenly you are alone, and you hear a music that is not orchestrated by any DJ, but is a music that is moved by the wind from this forest of bars that actually moving. So in this, in this moment of isolation, one actually goes, maybe sits down in a corner and thinks for a second of a moment of pause. So this was the construction, the experiment, the possibility of the constru construction of a pause. So thinking again about notions of facade and how one actually constructs a certain notion of scratch, uh, and looking into Chagall and this, uh, this project that he did for, uh, for this church and trying to understand how one produces a continuity, uh, and this project was translated into uh, optical uh, cable fibers that were able to go through the facade and construct all these different moments of expression and pause. So this is the section through the death pause level. Um, and here we have uh, some images that were helping me to devise and envision how this place would move. So free speech, invent words. Against the boom, utopia, visionary, phenomenology. La, these words were really scary in the 70s, right? 80s more. So, a word that I think was necessary to be invented in seven. We all know that the word utopia appeared in 1509. The word ideology appeared in 1748. The Studder C, he brought the word ideology of the science of ideas. Um, but there was. During 200 years, there was no word that would be able to carry within that. So when we actually think about utopia, some of, more often than not, we actually think of this idealized place that exists nowhere, that is a perfect place. And I have to argue and say no. That place is called ideotopia. It's the place of ideals. Utopia, and as you know, the game of the word eutopia, utopia, is the good place that exists in no place, is not necessarily any heaven. It's just desire to move away from a present condition. So as an architect, uh, what I like to do is try to construct words that are able to liberate and to give us spaces for action. There are always, throughout the history of ideas, projects that were utopian in spirit, and they had nothing to do with the utopias of like high modernism, like Le Corbusier, for instance. So those are part of this methodology of words. So if any time that you actually want to say this is a utopian project, if you can say this is an ideotopian project, I would appreciate that. <laughs> um, so how do we go into rethinking representation? And I think this was the first time I thought I would become an architect. I was in front of my Windows Media Player, and you would put um, a Stockhausen, right? And, and, and it would give you like this really funny topographies. Then you would put back, it would give you totally different topographies. And then you would put, I don't know, like visual crash, right? And it would have a totally different topography. So how actually one goes into visualizing sound and how a device as mundane as Windows Media Player is able to give you that, something that was fascinating to me. So how architecture, and this is a, an analysis that took a Chinese garden and worked through sound and through like the different uh, uh, specializations of sound, um, I think it's an extremely important device to, for architects to actually work through. 
And then we go to the manifesto. So, because I don't know how to make people laugh. So anyway, um, ecologies of excess. So welcome to ecologies of excess. <coughs> ecologies of excess is a projective archaeology that presents and explains a paradigmatic shift that occurred at the beginning of the 22nd century. During the 21st century, the 20th century architectural principle of machines for living was substituted by organisms for living, self-sufficient, sustainable prototypes that interacted and interchanged resources with the built environment were produced. A logic of multiscalar dynamics substituted the formal and programmatically stagnated, stagnating relationships of architecture to the city and to the world. There were no more cities inside houses, nor cities as houses. Spain, space became a continuous membrane with a multiplicity of new natures. Maps were drawn, new, new resources were mapped, and with them architects and buildings became absorbers of all quantifiable and verifiable data. However, the struggle among the control of the new resources perpetuated the same social, political, and environmental problems of the century before. The Ecologies of Excess movement introduced a radical epistemological change in relationship to the 21st century movement of sustainability or modern movement. Within the Ecologies of Excess, there were no principles to follow, no ideals to fulfill. What the Ecologies of Excess took is that while in the past architecture had been built according to certain principles and models of efficiency and control, Ecologies of Excess provided us with a guide to thinking, designing, and building based in what we actually, as human beings, are excessive. We produce, we consume, we pollute every single day. Each one of you, I don't know today if you felt bad when you throw that can into the wrong garbage bin. But you should, right? That's the society as we know it right now. But the Ecologies of Excess was able to bring a twist to that. Without measure, human beings produce endless amounts of energy in social, crowds, political wars, and environmental terms, pollution. Previous models of thought would see pollution, war, and destruction as collateral effects or damage of desired systems of production. Society was obsessed in quantifying and validating data. Rigor always acted against madness. If the birth of the clinic in Foucauldian terms brought the madness into a space of confinement, the ecologies of excess did the same with the notions of excess. So, as any kind of movement, one can trace this, this movement into a certain collection of buildings. So this is an archaeology of projects that happened during the 21st century, because, let me remind you, we are in the 22nd already, um, that look back into what actually happened. So, this little revolution in, econ in economical terms, the new war for economy, what it actually do, did was um, they realized that missiles and wars, uh, like 60% of wars were actually caused because of the industry behind the missiles was distributing guns in order to be able to produce those moments of production, consumption, and fear. They realized that actually instead of having missiles destroying cities, missiles would be able to do fireworks. So they started, Barcelona sent a missile attack to New York, throwing all these series of different fireworks in such a way that cities were not fighting anymore for power, but they were fighting for beauty. So cities would give presents of firework nights to other cities, while the missile industry would be totally happy, uh, and citizens even more. So the idea was that the war for economy, 60% of the wars were changed just by this shift of introduction within the military industry. So how the cities and the master planning and urban planners would think about those attacks and those ceremonies of fireworks was part of their task, was part of their probably fifth year class of urban planning. Um, political, the square of the revolutions. Uh, usually the squares were always designed for one preacher. Most of the times, this one happened actually in Cuba, in Havana, where there, is a huge esplanade, there was a huge esplanade with one speaker pulpit for one speaker. The moment that you multiply where everyone is a speaker, where everyone is a preacher, suddenly you have the possibility of actually having a collective voice. So all new typologies of squares become these spaces of total action. 
And ultimately, um, this is the ecology of excess, the moral, the LWB building, or the life we're building, or the love without boundaries. Um, by the end of the 21st century, the planet Earth became increasingly overpopulated. Political institutions around the globe were struggling to, over, to manage and control the coexistence of their citizens. Popular revolts were constant. Within this framework, in political terms, the causalities produced by a political and ideological enemy became extremely desirable. Strategies for population relief and control. The death of one's own civilian population became a desirable fact. Within this no new warfare framework, a new military tool was devised. The weaponized biological building, armed with life-inducing ecological bombs, became the new military tool born out of a new warfare value. The new warfare value is the ability to produce life and well-being. The strategy was to decimate an opposing political body by encouraging their population to expand to numbers which were unsustainable to the local bureaucracy and economy, producing independent, self-sustaining and self-governing archipelagos. As effective and devastating as 20th century bombs, the weaponized biological building were feared by political bodies, but paradoxically, welcomed by citizens. Thank you.